Welcome to the Nonprofit Show. We are so glad you're here. And today and tomorrow is a very special episode because we are doing Nonprofit Drill Down, two-part series with one of my favorites, Muhi Kwaja, who has joined us today. He's <laughs> trainer at Fundraising Academy. He's here to talk to us today and tomorrow all about the powerful end of year fundraising. So he's bringing to us a full day of conversation on today's episode as well as tomorrow. And mind you, that's still 30 minutes today, 30 minutes tomorrow, only I'm going to say 60 minutes. And I know this topic, Muhi, could go on for hours. So I'm excited to hear really that cream of the crop of what you've brought to the conversation. But before we ask you to spill the tea and all of the good information, we want to remind all of our viewers who we are, if we have not had the pleasure of meeting you yet, Julia Patrick is here with me today. She is CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. So grateful to you, Julia, because this month we will reach a monumental milestone of our 900th episode. And I am so honored to serve alongside you day in and day out. I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd. That's Julia Patrick's personal nonprofit nerd, but also all of yours because there's plenty of nerdiness to go around. CEO of The Raven Group. And I have really enjoyed these conversations. They are high level thought leader conversations. We started March of 2020, a little bit of a labor of love, but oh, thanks yeah. to our amazing partners, presenting sponsors, they've allowed us to attract some really top talent. Mm -hmm. So thank you to our friends over at Bloomerang. American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, where, of course, Muhi joins us from for today as well as tomorrow. Also, thank you to Nonprofit Thought Leader, your part-time controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, as well as Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the companies that allow us these unscripted and sometimes filter opportunities. If you're watching and you're seeing some of the special filters that our guest is adding today to really add to his seriousness. Um, but again, grateful to have our presenting partners with us. Again, I mentioned 900 plus episodes and here's where you can find them. So for those of you listening, you can download the app. So go to your app store and just, you know, call out the nonprofit show. Voila, we pull up. You can also scan that QR code if you're watching. We can also be found on streaming broadcast platforms as well as podcast platforms. So I like to say wherever you do your binge watches or binge listening, you can join us there for the nonprofit show as well. Okay, Muhi, you have been so patient, which I know is a huge character trait of yours. <laughs> Muhi Kwaja joins us, MPA, CFRM. He joins us as a trainer from Fundraising Academy, but he's also a co-founder of the American Muslim Community Foundation. Welcome back. Thank you so much. What an honor and pleasure it is to be here with you. Um, thinking about those filters, I should just be in like the bunny rabbit or the robot or whatever one just to... Yeah. Spice it up a little, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, my God. Well, okay, I don't even know how to follow that up. <laughs> 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 because we were, if you joined us for the green room chatter, we were saying, you know, like when I work with Muhi, he's very studious. He's very thoughtful, very measured, um, very serious. And Jared's like, what? He's a hoot. Jared has like a whole different like vibe. And I'm like, wow, really? Because, you know, so I think it's funny because we don't always work all three of us together. Mm -hmm. right? So that's kind of a, a fun thing. Mui, before we move too much further, um, can you talk to us? And I know we're going to do a much more in-depth episode, but can you share with us um, the American Muslim Community Foundation and in that journey and kind of what that looks like, because I think when we know that it gives us a different light about some of the things that you, you talk about. Yeah, I would love to. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, and American Muslim Community Foundation was started back in 2016. Uh -huh. uh, I'm a co-founder there uh, and have been a volunteer, a contractor, part-time, full-time employee, uh, so everything under the sun other than a board member. Uh, and I wanted it that way just so that there could be more autonomy uh, and also 
uh, less founder syndrome involved uh, with the organization. Uh, I wanted there to be discussion and dialogue in the organization and not just my singular voice. Um, we've had other co-founders be advisors, board members, um, but there's always been a good representation between the staff and the board and um, getting things done. But as many of you, some of you have probably started your own nonprofit. You've been with a nonprofit. Uh, I've been a one-person development team. I've been a chief development officer for a team of four. Um, I've been an uh, interim director of development. Um, you name it, I've done it. Uh, and it has been awesome being able to take these best practices that Fundraising Academy teaches. And even before I joined Fundraising Academy as a trainer, was doing all of these things since 2009. Um, I got into this at the University of Michigan in the Development Summer Internship Program. So as a student, was integrated into the philanthropy of the university and how they fundraised with the Office of University Development 500 staff to raise billions of dollars each year. Mm -hmm. um, and then I worked at small nonprofits. And with AMCF, that genesis has kind of been um, all of my experience poured into this entity that helps families distribute their charitable giving through donor advised funds, helps nonprofits set up endowments. Um, and we manage over $2.4 million of assets under management. So still a relatively small community foundation. Uh, but where I think our impact has been is rewriting the script of what donor advised funds do and how community foundations operate. So we have given out more than $10 million since 2017. Um, where we're not trying to collectively hoard the wealth of the community, we're trying to distribute it. Um, so, you know, a uh, big testament to the organization, the staff members, the leaders, the partners that we are able to work with to distribute their zakat and sadaqa, uh, which is their religious tithing. Mm -hmm. um, so we can dive more into that another day, but I know we have a lot to focus on. But what I am going to be sharing today are all the things that I'm doing at AMCF myself for our year-end fundraising. So it's, it's so interesting, and I can't wait... Uh to to really dive into this at another point in time because you know as we think of a lot of the community foundations as literally being you know at the corner of main and union street type of thing yeah and yet with you you're really a national organization mm -hmm. working with you know a, a niche community and so I, I can't wait to talk about that but i i appreciate you kind of linking us in so that we could understand um, how you come to this and, and what you think about. So really briefly, one of the things that we work with you on and you help us understand along with the other trainers um, from Fundraising Academy is this cause selling cycle. And so help me understand, is this going away or is this part of the year end? Like how does this ecosystem fit into what we're going to be talking about? Of course, you know, whether it's a capital campaign, annual campaign, major gifts, um, stewardship and events like you can implement the cause selling cycle wherever you need to deepen relationships with your donors. Um, so I would say that it's still relevant for year end fundraising. OK, um, and it depends on where you are in the life cycle of your relationship with your donor. Uh, where you are in their um, engagement with your organization. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, prospecting is really simply put, like finding the donor's name. Like if you have a portfolio, you should be prospecting that portfolio through and through. You should be trying to find out more about them. Uh, and that's where the pre-approach comes in. You are gathering the information that you need um, to make an informed decision on how to engage this donor in your portfolio with the gift that they are, you are going to ask them for. But even before you do that, um, you need to introduce yourself. That's the approach. Uh, then you need to figure out what the donor's passions are. That's the need discovery. Uh, and once you are able to collect all of that information, mm -hmm. you're ready to 
ask for a meeting to present your mission to the donor and prospect. Uh, and you get to tell the story of your mission. You get to share why you are working at this nonprofit and why you're so passionate. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the presentation. Um, then naturally, they may have some questions for you. And that's handling the objections. Um, that may be overcoming the potential roadblocks to get the donor to feel more comfortable to commit. Uh, and once you've handled all of their objections, you're ready to make the ask. Um, and a lot of times people jump to the ask without doing any of these other steps. And that's where they stumble. Um, and they miss out on the opportunity to deepen the relationship. Um, and the best way to deepen the relationship is after you receive the gift is to properly steward your donors. You get to follow up with the results of how their gift made an impact. Um, so that's the eight step cause selling cycle in two minutes or less. <laughs> <laughs> That's impressive, my friend. That's impressive. Mui, I have a question, especially as we're talking of end of year, you know, Q4, 90 days might sound silly, but should we only be focused on phase two and phase three and just kind of hold off phase one until Q1, right? Like January of next year, because what you Ooh. said made me believe we're still working all three phases all eight steps. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? That's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, you know, I haven't really thought of that, but what I would say is make it work for your organization and where you are. You can't successfully get to the ask without doing the other steps before it, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But if you're at limited capacity and you can only do so much research, so much prospecting, you have to start somewhere. And I definitely wouldn't start at step seven of eight. Um, so if you can't do steps one and two, at least start at step three. Um, but do what you can to find out the most about your donors before reaching out to them uh, is what I would say. You know, that's, that's really great. And I know yeah. too, we all know this, we're in event season, right? The end of the yep. year is typically when we do have some new individuals joining us. Maybe they've been brought to us by a board member, by another partner, you know, so I think organically we are having, you know, part of the phase one and even early phase two naturally mm -hmm. occur. And then I also can't help to think if we don't continue phase one and early phase two, next year is going to start off pretty dry, <laughs> you know, like sure. we have to keep working with these individuals. So I appreciate you really bringing that to the forefront. I want to know, we always say data is sexy, but talk to us about <laughs> how we can look at the data and make determinations first. Uh, what does that look like and what data are we really looking to pull? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, hopefully your CRM is equipped with the ability to pull a donor report list, showcase who's given uh, this year to date, who's given last year, who's given the year before that, and let the data inform who you're going to approach. Um, and we'll get into a little bit more about the different types of reports you should be pulling but your data, what is in your CRM, in their profile, what's listed, that's gonna be your best friend to make an informed decision. Mm -hmm. um, so if I see somebody and I'm helping a capital campaign client right now, go through this very exercise of where do these donors fall in the gift range chart? Mm -hmm. There have been some donors giving since the 2000, uh, 100 bucks a month. Um, there have been some donors who have been uh, haven't been giving since 2018, uh, and we don't know why. Right. Um, so all of these things are going to inform where you place your donors. But what's your year end goal? Let's start there. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Maybe it's one point five million dollars anywhere in between or below. And you have to think through, OK, what? lead gift do we need to secure this um, year-end campaign and drive momentum to inspire other people to give? 
Maybe you use that lead gift as a match. Maybe you're having those conversations with those potential lead donors first saying, we're going to be heading into the year end campaign. We're going live on giving Tuesday. You have another, you know, six weeks before then to figure out who you're going to talk to, what amount you're going to ask them. Can they do it as a match? Mm -hmm. uh, and then promote that through the year end giving. So these are just a few ways in which you can see historically through your data, when have those donors given? Has it been typically at the year end? Um, and approaching those donors by people who made gifts in October, November, December, uh, and making sure that you reach out to them this year end campaign. Um, have people already given in 2023, but maybe uh, historically they've given you $1,000, but they've only given you $250 this year so far? Sure. Do you approach them again to get them to that thousand dollar mark or more? Um, so these are the types of things that I would be looking at for sure. You know, it's interesting because I love what you're saying, because I think what happens is a lot of times we're like, OK, we just have to work harder. We have to work longer. We have to be more frenetic. And as opposed to stepping back and saying, OK, let's be a little bit more intentional and and look at what the actual environment is holding and, and and what can we learn from that so i really appreciate you kind of giving us that framework this is Julia, i have a question before we move forward i want to know muhi from the data that you're pulling how much of it do you share or do you share with your board members Oof, yeah this is a great question yeah. um so i received that file from the treasurer on the staff um and you know i let them know like for the capital campaign committee i want to be sharing this data um and you know there could be arguments made that it should be anonymized somehow or maybe cumulative amounts should be put into ranges so it's not specific uh, but again go based on the capacity that your organization has if all board members, all capital campaign members have signed NDAs, mm -hmm. I think it's okay to share the information, yeah. um, but there could be political things. There could be um, just other things involved there that you don't know in the history of the organization um, that may come up if people see this information. Mm -hmm. where one board member may feel slighted that they've been giving far more than somebody else and vice versa. But again, it's based on people's capacity. They're uh, making this a top three donation in the year for themselves. And with capital campaigns, it's definitely much different than an annual campaign, uh, but it all applies. Um, so really depends on um, the dynamic of the board, the history of the organization, who's involved, who's seeing it. Um, I've heard it both sides of the equation. So, yeah. yeah, I have too. And I appreciate you answering that. I feel like on a lot of social channels and forums I'm a part of, I see that question often, you know, is my board of directors are asking to see a list and they want to see the total amount for every single donor, you know, like really, what is that looking at? But um, Julia, I, I paused you for moving forward because I know we want to talk about the the actual reports, and we're going to name two specific reports, Muhi, that you suggest we pull. They are two of my favorites. I remember learning these early in my career, and I'm like, what the heck? I don't speak this language, but CRM reports of Cybunt and Alibunt. What the heck do they stand for, Muhi, and why should we pull them? Definitely. Um, you've clearly spelled it out here. So some years, but not this year, means that your donor has given previously, but they have not given this year or maybe even the year before. Mm -hmm. So it allows you to look at your historical giving. I'd say however far back your CRM can go, um, but okay. at least three years, five years. Yeah. Um, so it allows you to have that historical aspect. It allows you to try to win back some donors. The retention is one of the sexiest things that I can think of when it comes to a metric and a KPI for your staff. 
see how many donors they can retain, get them back into the giving, into their portfolio. Um, it just gives me such satisfaction when I win back a donor. Uh, I yeah. don't know. Hopefully you feel the same way. Um, and then last year, but not this year, is literally somebody who gave in 2022, but hasn't given yet in 2023. Um, and these two reports should be looked at quarterly um, at a minimum, especially for if you're doing like a spring campaign, a year end campaign. Okay. Uh, these are reports that you should be religiously looking at. So, Muhi, it's so interesting because if you think about Liebunt and Cybunt and you factor in COVID, you know, I know that yeah. so many donors were like, hey, we have to pause our giving to cultural institutions and put them into human services um, and sure. things of that nature. How do we look at this and, and, and be um, thoughtful about the context, right? Because if we've been doing this all along, or even we do this next year, it's it's going to be different, right? So so how can you advise us on that? Yeah, definitely. And everybody's experience through COVID was different. Um, right. Some some families had investments and did really well. Uh, other families were struggling financially, and you know, month to month were struggling. Mm -hmm. um, so looking at it from a cautious perspective, if people had stopped giving in 2020 and 2021, have they resumed giving in 2022, 2023, mm -hmm. or have they been left on the wayside forgotten? Mm -hmm. I know some organizations I've been at, they don't even try to focus on retention as the strategy, which is appalling to me. It's a, such a missed opportunity. Um, and if they're like, they haven't been given and we asked them and sent them the letter, but like there are other ways to engage them and try to revisit the conversation and not to give up so easily. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I would say every donor is going to be unique and that's why it's so important to do the need discovery uh, to see why have they stopped giving and build that relationship over trust and report so that you can have those conversations. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, yes, there have definitely been challenges through COVID, um, but it's not a reason to stop engaging your donors. Mm -hmm. I have a question about the amount of communication, right? And I know tomorrow yeah. we have drill down part two and we will mm -hmm. probably touch on some of this even more, but I'm curious because I've heard a little bit of everything where now yeah. is the time to ramp up our communications to the point of weekly emails. I hear also, you know, it's also time to just stick with your monthly, you know, pick up the phone more, engage them in coffee meetings, you know, events, things like that. What are you coaching when it comes to this standpoint on how much should we really be sending right now? Yeah. One of my other favorite things to do is unsubscribe from emails. <laughs> if I get something way too often, um, you know, the nonprofit show will stay on my email list. I'm not going to unsubscribe from you guys, Woo! but that makes sense because you guys are a daily podcast. You're getting that out there. For other nonprofits, I think that monthly is enough. Okay. Really? Okay. Um, if there's a special announcement and you have a targeted list, you're doing an event in a certain state, yes, bi-weekly, by all means, okay. at the most. Um, like, think of AMCF. We have nonprofits. We have donor advised funds. So we do segment in those areas. Um, yeah. And... We do presentations. We're doing a stock market update for Q1 to Q3. Uh, and we're opening this up to all of the nonprofits, all of the donor advice funds and the general public. So we emailed it once in September. We emailed it again in October. The event is next week. We've posted it through other mediums, social media, text blast. We've done it in other ways to get multiple touch points, but... I'm very specific on 
no more than two emails a month uh, mm -hmm. overall. One is a generic, everybody gets it. The second email is specific to the constituency. Um, that's my philosophy. I will do a text message blast about once a month as well and switch up the cadence. Um, so that's what I personally feel works best and doesn't um, overly burden the donor. Um, but, you know, I'll often get people saying, oh, yeah, I saw your message uh, and things like that. So they are opening it. They are seeing it. You can look at all the metrics of how effective it is, what the click rate is, right. um, all of that. So. I would hate for somebody to unsubscribe because I've emailed them once a week Especially, when I know that I could keep them as a lifetime donor. Yeah. Especially at this end of year. Absolutely. I mean, this is this is a critical time. Well, for those of you watching and listening, today has been fantastic. It has flown by as all yeah. conversations really has. typically do with you, Muhi. But I'm thrilled because tomorrow is day two. Today, as a recap, we really are talking about plan for your year ahead, you know, going into reviewing your database, what is the data telling you so you can make those informed decisions, and then to pull two specific reports, which I love, Muhi, and I heard you, my friend, this should be pulled, not just these two yeah. reports at the end of the year, quarterly, so every <clears throat> single it. quarter. So tomorrow, day two, we're going to talk about stewardship, outreach plans, and again, more on campaign communications. So Julia, I'm always amazed when we have a fundraising academy trainer. You know, you and I both have been in the sector quite some time, but I'm still learning new material and I just oh, yeah. adore that. <laughs> I, I agree. And I think that, um, you know, it's it's a, a more intelligent approach to how we work with philanthropy in our country, as opposed to just, you know, guilting people in it or the, you know, I gave to your charity, so now it's time for you to give to my charity kind of mentality, which I think has been a lot of what's been going on. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, the back scratching lives. But um, so this, I always enjoy this because I think it's just a much more transparent, effective and sustainable approach, all these things. So Muhi, this has been amazing. Um, again, join us tomorrow, tomorrow with Muhi Kwaja as we navigate the second day. And as Jared started off today in the nonprofit show, we could do hours of this. So for okay. us to come down to, you know, two 30 minute segments, we've worked hard to, to do this. And that's why we call them drill downs. We don't do them very often um, because it's, it's really an intense, you know, opportunity. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy been joined by the nonprofit nerd herself, Jared R. Ransom, CEO of the Raven Group. And that's right, Mui just pushed up his glasses as we all should be doing. Hey, again, we are here because we have amazing support from our presenting sponsors, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, fundraising academy at National University, where Mui joins us from, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that join us day in and day out. As Jarrett mentioned, I'm just in a short amount of time, we will be hitting our 900th episode. And wow. so you'll need to stay tuned for that because we have some fun things planned um, for that milestone. It'll be a lot of fun. Okay, Muhi, you've got the creative juices and the intellectual matter moving around on my brain. Tomorrow, we're gonna go into day two. So be prepared for even more questions, my friend. Can't wait. All right. Hey, everybody, as we like to sign off each and every episode of the Nonprofit Show, we want to remind you, ourselves, our guests, especially Muhi, because he's got to be back here tomorrow, <laughs> to stay well so you can do well. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you back here tomorrow.